senior scientist from Lockheed Martin. Uh, I have 27 patents. Approximately 13 years ago, I ran across a person who, uh, who had been given a job by Dr. Teller. Dr. Teller was uh, Oppenheimer's right, right-hand man. And even after Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer was thrown out of Area 51. Uh, Dr. Tiller stayed there and was in charge of several programs. Uh, the person that I contact twice to three times per month is the head of that program now. And uh, they uh, continually update me on everything they possibly can. I do have a top secret clearance. I choose, however, for their purposes not to use it because they, the intelligent ones of me and me, actually believe that a great deal of information should be lifted up from those dark recesses of Area 51 and moved over so people can see it. So that's uh, what began about 13 years ago. I, uh, since I am a scientist, I do not believe in, in theory. I basically say, follow the data, theory be damned. If something can't verify by a physical test that something is true, then I do not care to accept it in, in that, that I that I present. Therefore, everything we present here will be will be data that uh, comes directly from them through me to you. The uh, subject of of today has. There are those that uh, are acquainted with the fact that there were Phoenix lights that occurred over Phoenix uh, two, about two years ago. They were photographed, and those really turned out to be just blobs in, across the Phoenix sky. Uh, it turned out to be that, that a very dear friend of mine took his wife, his wife up a mountain on uh, Valentine's Day, and uh, they uh, took a photograph of Tucson. It turned out to be when they developed the film, there were a total of five UFOs across Tucson proper. And uh, this is Tucson as they saw it. Can you get that? So here's the picture of Tucson, as he had it. Then, as he developed further, notice that there are five very distinct UFOs along the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. One of them is even canted a bit, about 45 degrees. Now, the person that took the film said that he had he had a, a mothership underneath and one up high. This shows the high the high one. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I I know that I can buy the ship. My name is Scott Faree. I live in Vail, Arizona. Uh, a friend of mine who manages a nonprofit in Tucson asked me to take 
some photos for him for his website. And he was looking for a sunrise uh, picture of kind of the skyline of downtown Tucson. Uh, so I had gone out, actually on, on Valentine's Day evening, I dragged my wife up to A Mountain so that I could go up there and just block out some shots, um, kind of plan uh, the, the photos that I was ultimately going to take for that website. And so we got up on A Mountain just as the sun was setting. I set up my uh, Canon 40D on a tripod, opened the shutter up fully. I really wasn't looking for picture quality. I was, like I said, I was looking to block out where I wanted to set the camera and the angles that I wanted to take. And so I started to uh, click off some photos. And I had these set with a uh, timer release on the shutter so I didn't get any camera vibration because it was the sun was starting to set. We were running into fairly low light. And I took... I don't know, it was probably six or eight pictures. I figured I'd had enough that I could take a look at tomorrow, take a look at the next day and decide what I liked. Um, so we went out to dinner that night, uh, went home the following day. I uploaded these photos onto my laptop, and I noticed some lights that I really didn't expect to see up above uh, the Santa Catalina Mountains. Um, and upon closer inspection, and as I really ran out the contrast in the photo, um, I ended up with something that I still can't explain to this day. Uh, this is the original photo, and these lights were showing up just over the top of the mountain. Uh, I took a second photo probably oh, five or six seconds later, as long as it would have taken for me to reset the, the timer. And in fact, this group of lights was in a much more narrow band, and now about... Well, I don't know, I can't really say distance-wise, but they would moved quite a ways from where that original grouping had taken place. So I still have no explanation for the camera, I, or for the pictures. These images, these lights have not shown up in any other photos that I've taken. Uh, I'm at a loss as to what they might be, and certainly curious uh, as to okay. where those lights came from. Now, my, uh, they, they certainly are very, I mean, very here's, similar images. Here's up and flying. Let me go through, now on the ships, in order for me to believe it, I had to get blow-ups, and so here are two of them, which is blown up much higher, and I think I have one that, oh uh, yeah, you can see the 45 degree candidate UFO. Now see, the only reason that I bought everything that he said is because my people have been feeding me for 13 years uh, pictures, not only pictures of, of uh, just plain pictures, but they, I, I gave them assignments, uh, being a senior scientist, and they uh, got a picture of up close and personal. This is a UFO which is ready to take off. And it is very up close. And they inform me that there are three elements which the UFO is contained. One is telluride, the other is germanium, the other is palladium. I did not say a metal once. And not only that, but the things pick up and fly using anti-gravity. Now, that's one picture. Here's another picture. In this case, the, the uh, UFO is not turned on, ready to fly. Therefore, it only shows on the upper part of it. And generally, it's white on the underside when power is applied. He is, here's also another of the same, of the same order. Now these UFOs are 38 feet in diameter and it was rather surprising to me since I actually physically gave them my camera. They took this picture as a UFO was departing. Within one flick of my camera, they got three UFOs. That's real. 
And yeah, we don't know why either. Now also when UFOs come in, they, they like a, we have a heads up display for our pilots. They do too. This is what their pilots see in order to tell them how to come to area 51 and land. And not only that, they can go to a vertical hole in a mountain over 51 and go down a shaft. They don't have to, they don't have wheels. They don't have anything like that. They take off by going up straight. And then, now not only that, but they travel extremely rapidly. Their home planet is Quintonia, which is 68, 68 light years from us. They, to my surprise, when I asked them how fast they take to get from that, it should be 68,000 years to make it according to Einstein. But they're able to make it to us in 25 years. So I gave them an assignment to photograph the planets from space as they were coming back. And they did that. And you see Jupiter and Saturn and Mars and Earth as it's seen by UFOs. And here's another. Now, we aren't going through motherships or anything like that. Nevertheless, those are the you have now when they actually get powered up and actually start traveling, it turns like this. You do not hear sound. They're up they they travel like that, they look like that, and they travel extremely rapidly. Now the question is is who are they? Here's another one that's you see the bottom, how it's all white. That's it's it's turned on. Here's also the bottom turned on. Strangely enough, uh, I asked them to take pictures of the power unit on the bottom, up close and personal. They gave me this. I don't know what this means. That's when my camera actually looks into the power center of the UFO. Now, the uh, the I, I asked them to uh, tell me about who was flying these things. He therefore said, fine, they're approximately five, five feet, four and a half to five feet tall. They, they had one or, one or two of them around the, that were 230 years old. And they, we have a total of at least 18 that exist and operate with our facility as Teller set it up. Now notice the eyes are different, nose are different, but they do have five fingers, five toes, uh, two eyes, uh, and uh, rather strangely enough, I asked him how they communicate. He says, well, it's like this, Ward. You all of a sudden have a question in your mind. You walk into a room with, with one of them, and all of a sudden you find yourself giving the answer to your question in your own voice. They're able to use your own voice by telepathy to talk to you. And I said, fine. Now that's how they look front. But when you turn around and look at the back, it's like that. Now notice that they have three back bones. They're actually cartilage. Nevertheless, it's a much more efficient system as ours. They also have three ribs in their system rather than, than more. This is also the back side of an alien. Here's a, 
45 degree look. And here's the back of the head. Notice the veins and no hair. And now when we talk about aliens, I push the issue and he said, well, there's kind of two groups of aliens. Well, he divided them, they divide them into two groups. Uh, one group he calls, it's like you have a ranch. And you have a ranch and you find that, that uh, one group are your wranglers that know how to wrangle your cattle. There are others are wrestlers, ones that steal your cattle. And indeed, that the, the two groups um, do act differently to the ones that are that are wranglers are much more friendly and have a, a better relationship with us. Here's uh, the other side of the alien too. Now also notice that their feet where they have five toes the toes are joined together like a frog, and uh, yet they are are uh, dissimilar. Now there was a surprising occurrence, and that is my friend had one of them that that uh, was a friend, and he died here. And ten days after his death. I was out visiting my buddy who's in this picture. And if you look very close, you can see that his friend is in spirit form and right over his left shoulder. You can also see that the fingers are long, that, uh, that there is something. We have an expression that basically say, when a person dies, they stay around their body for three days and then go off. And uh, they basically have the same thing that happens to them. Now, with respect to the, the alien craft, we have American citizens which are suited up like this and they are working on UFOs 24 hours a day and we're trying to learn what to do. These are two guys, two American citizens, and they're trying to protect themselves against the germs and things like that. And here's a, another view of them. And here's another one. In, there's an upper part of a UFO and a lower part of a UFO. This is the upper part, and it's just one of them up there. They have a, generally we give them suspenders so that if they start floating, they don't have gravity on the inside. Somebody can grab them and pull them over to the side. And this is the home planet that they come from, which they call Quintonia. Now notice that the hand, that's an alien hand. Notice that it is, that the fingers are longer than ours by quite a bit, about 30% longer and that's just the way they're put together. Now, at any rate, the, uh, the, uh, this process that introduced me directly or indirectly to Dr. Teller's work with a group that still is in charge of, of Area 51 and equivalent turned out to be a doctor, a very, very fine gentleman. 
and I was carrying on a conversation with him, he saw how the subject was going. So he simply said, well, you need to know, you need to know what I did one day. And I said, okay. He said, I was in the process of doctoring a pilot who was a test pilot, a Navy test pilot for the United States government. And it was 1947. He said, I, uh, I, he began, I don't know if it's a drug I had in one or what was occurring, but he basically told me that uh, he was, that they, the radar group, had found a blip out over New Mexico and that they would like to assign me to go out and check it out. So he said, fine. I'll do that. And he got the fastest airplane that existed then, was a propeller at the time. And it had, was fully armed and all the rest of those things. Nevertheless, he uh, was out flying and he found the item and he immediately communicated back and he said, I wish authority, I, first of all, I want you to tell me, are there any other airplanes flying? Are there commercial or anything else around other than he and I? He said, just, just the two of you. And he said, fine. Second thing I want to know is, do I have authority to shoot it down? They said, why do you want authority to shoot it down? He says, because I am flying the fastest thing that the United States can make, and he's beginning to leave me. Therefore, I know he's either a friend or an enemy, and if he's leaving me, he's an enemy. Therefore, I wish authority to shoot it down. The commander said, fine. He granted him authority. He pulled in. He shot him down. He came down. He flew past and saw that there was a road on the one side of a fence area. He came down and landed his, his airplane. Hard to do, but he did. And then he cut across the fence. One of them, the door was open. One of them was out walking around. Uh, but he didn't care about that. He cared about what the vehicle was. So he went over and rather strangely enough, when he ducked down, because they're only five feet high, high, he saw that he could see through the walls. Not only that, but as he stepped in, the floor was spongy. He looked at the three that were there and they were dead. He knew they were. He'd kill them. But he also knew that the military would come and he'd put up with those guys for a long time. So he went over, went back across the, across the barbed wire fence, got in his airplane and took off. Therefore, he was never briefed out at all. And he didn't give my friend authority to be, to tell to allow me to know what his name was. I know, but I won't reveal it. I, they, both of them should have been gone for a long time. Nevertheless, so when I uh, asked, when I got up with my contacts in Area 51, I brought up that story and they said, well, that's totally true, but we can't say it, you can. And that's how they've kept me all this time, is I can talk about it, but they can't. I do, because of some very good reasons, keep things within control, but I don't want us to fall behind the Russians and Chinese. And the problem I have 
is that Area 51 is working with both the Russians and Chinese right now. And uh, try, trying to make UFOs, they have, uh, there's been a total of 39 United States citizens that have lost their lives trying to reverse engineer UFOs. And uh, it's, well, the last one I heard of was a year and a half ago where we lost 19 lives in one test. They actually wanted to bring various flying craft near the UFO, and the UFO defended itself, and 19 of our people died. Now, they kept giving me things to, I, rather than, they would give me pieces of UFOs, and I would come to my laboratories. I had the laboratories of Lockheed and every place else, so I, I would do that, but I would, I would get pieces of UFOs. For example, I have three little pieces of UFOs down underneath the thing that looks like a, a quartz crystal. Notice that my I that is my hand, and it is giving weight. It says that. It weighs 100 grams. Now, without those three items, when I take the UFO material away, notice that uh, the, the three UFO items are gone. But also notice that the weight of the crystal is now 600 and 650 grams. The implication here is that if I were to take the pieces of UFO and put them underneath an average man's scale, he would weigh 45 pounds. Basically, they're working in anti-gravity, and therefore our effort is anti-gravity. Now, not only that, but we take these same pieces of items, and I go to a standard voltmeter, and notice that in my voltmeter, I am getting a total voltage of 249 volts out of one rock, one piece of UFO. Not only that, but the team took a piece of UFO and connected it up like this and was able to have a complete laboratory operate for six months with heavy equipment. And it goes all the way up to, to 12 amperes. And, and since you didn't really get this before, here's the foot with the toes joined together. And this is a better view of the same. Now notice also, this is the body of an alien. And where we have six ribs that are connected together, they have three. And the total height is less than five, five feet. And they still look like this, not like you and I. Nevertheless, so we're able to obtain voltages and anti-gravity. And anti-gravity appears several ways, which is rather unique and nice. Scotty talked about UFOs. I basically said, yeah, I understand, because here is what Area 51 was giving to me since the year 2000 and beyond. Notice it's recent. And we have one trial 
then we have one, two, three, four, five, and we have one that's 150 feet across, if not larger. And each one of these are separate, separate documentation of UFOs that were photographed and taken uh, across the world from 2000, the year 2004. Now, when you actually get what that all means is the UFO, when it's white and on the enemy side, is ready to fly like that. And it's anti-gravity, that's the reason you don't hear anything. But when it's just parked, Park means just floating in air. It could be above your house. Like this, this, and this. This turns out to be the the heads-up display that the aliens see of how to go to Area 51 and store the craft. Nevertheless, this is what the craft looked like. That's what, how they change power, and, and notice that here's an egg-like thing, but it's standing on end, only because it has no gravity itself, and that is a piece of, of UFO germanium, and this little dot is a piece of neodymium magnet which is above the germanium and it's floating all by itself. And that again is a UFO. And we don't know why but a crystal appears to be a colored rose and we can't figure out why yet. Now, there's a whole batch of analysis with, that we're having to do. Alien, side view, front view, top view, line. And that's the power center of palladium in the middle of the craft. Thank <laughs> you.